Suppose you wanted to set up the ideal experiment to demonstrate the evolution of camouflage. What would you do? Camouflaged animals resemble the background on which they are seen. Could you set up an experiment in which animals actually evolve before your very eyes to resemble a background that you have experimentally provided for them? Preferably two backgrounds, with a different population on each. The aim is to do something like the selection of two lines of maize plants for high and low oil content that we saw earlier. But in these experiments, the selection will be done not by humans, but by predators and by female guppies. The only thing that will separate the two experimental lines is the different backgrounds that we shall supply. Take some animals of a camouflage species, perhaps a species of insect, and assign them randomly to different cages or enclosures or ponds, whatever is suitable, which have differently coloured or differently patterned backgrounds. For example, you might give half the enclosures a green foresty background and the other half a reddish brown deserty background. Having put your animals in their green or brown enclosures, you'd then leave them to live and breed for as many generations as you have time for, after which you'd come back to see whether they'd evolved to resemble their backgrounds, green or brown, respectively. Of course, you only expect this result if you put predators in the enclosure too. So let's put, say, a chameleon in. In all the enclosures? No, of course not. This is an experiment, remember. So you'd put a predator in half the green enclosures and half the brown enclosures. The experiment would be to test the prediction that, in enclosures with a predator, the insects would evolve to become either green or brown, to become more similar to their background. But in the enclosures without a predator, they might, if anything, evolve to become more different from their background, to be conspicuous to females. I have long nursed an ambition to do exactly this experiment with fruit flies because their reproductive turnover time is so short. But alas, I never got around to it. So I am especially delighted to say that this is exactly what John Endler did, not with insects but with guppies. Obviously he didn't use chameleons for predators, but instead chose a fish called the pike cichlid, Cranicicla alta, which is a dangerous predator of these guppies in the wild. Nor did he use green versus brown backgrounds. He opted for something more interesting than that. He had noticed that guppies derive much of their camouflage from their spots, often quite large ones, whose patterning resembles the patterning of the gravelly bottoms of their native streams. Some streams have coarser, more pebbly gravel, others finer, more sandy gravel. Those were the two backgrounds he used, and you'll agree that the camouflage he was seeking was subtler and more interesting than my green versus brown. Endler got a large greenhouse to simulate the tropical world of the guppies and set up ten ponds inside it. He put gravel on the bottom of all ten ponds, but five of them had coarse pebbly gravel and the other five had finer sandy gravel. You can see where this is going. The prediction is that when exposed to strong predation, the guppies on the two backgrounds will diverge from each other over evolutionary time, each in the direction of matching its own background. Where predation is weak or non-existent, the prediction is that the males should tend in the direction of becoming more conspicuous to appeal to females. Instead of putting predators in half the ponds and no predators in the other half, again Endler did something more subtle. He had three levels of predation. Two ponds, one fine and one coarse gravel, had no predators at all. Four ponds, two fine and two coarse gravel, had the dangerous pike cichlid. In the remaining four ponds, Endler introduced another species of fish, Rivulus hartii, which, despite its English name, killifish, is relatively harmless to guppies. Actually, that's quite irrelevant, since it is named after a Mr. Killy. It is a weak predator, whereas the pike cichlid is a strong predator. The weak predator situation is a better control condition than no predators at all. This is because, as Endler explains, he was trying to simulate two natural conditions, and he knows of no natural streams that are totally free of predators. Thus, the comparison between strong and weak predation is a more natural comparison. So here's the setup. Guppies were assigned randomly to ten ponds, five with coarse gravel and five with fine gravel. 
all ten colonies of guppies were allowed to breed freely for six months with no predators. At this point, the experiment proper began. Endler put one dangerous predator into each of two coarse gravel ponds and two fine gravel ponds. He put six weak predators, six rather than one to give a closer approximation to the relative densities of the two kinds of fish in the wild, into each of two coarse gravel ponds and two fine gravel ponds. And the remaining two ponds just carried on as before, with no predators at all. After the experiment had been running for five months, Endler took a census of all the ponds and counted and measured the spots on all the guppies in all the ponds. Nine months later, that is after fourteen months in all, he took another census, counting and measuring in the same way. And what of the results? They were spectacular, even after so short a time. Endler used various measures of the fish's colour patterns, one of which was spots per fish. When the guppies were first put into their ponds before the predators were introduced, there was a very large range of spot numbers because the fish had been gathered from a wide variety of streams of widely varying predator content. During the six months before any predators were introduced, the mean number of spots per fish shot up. Presumably this was in response to selection by females. Then, at the point when the predators were introduced, there was a dramatic change. In the four ponds that had the dangerous predator, the mean number of spots plummeted. The difference was fully apparent at the five-month census, and the number of spots had declined even further by the fourteen-month census. But in the two ponds with no predators, and the four ponds with weak predation, the number of spots continued to increase. It reached a plateau as early as the five-month census and stayed high for the fourteen-month census. With respect to spot number, weak predation seems to be pretty much the same as no predation, overruled by sexual selection by females who prefer lots of spots. So much for spot number. Spot size tells an equally interesting story. In the presence of predators, whether weak or strong, coarse gravel promoted relatively larger spots, while fine gravel favoured relatively smaller spots. This is easily interpreted as spot size mimicking stone size. Fascinatingly, however, in the ponds where there were no predators at all, Endler found exactly the reverse. Fine gravel favoured large spots on male guppies, and coarse gravel favoured small spots. They are more conspicuous if they do not mimic the stones on their respective backgrounds, and that is good for attracting females. Neat. Yes, neat, but that was in the lab. Could Endler get similar results in the wild? Yes. He went to a natural stream that contained the dangerous pike cichlids, in which the male guppies were all relatively inconspicuous. He caught guppies of both sexes and transplanted them to a tributary of the same stream that contained no guppies and no dangerous predators, although the weak predators, killifish, were present. He left them there to get on with living and breeding, and went away. Twenty-three months later he returned and re-examined the guppies to see what had happened. Amazingly, after less than two years, the males had shifted noticeably in the direction of being more brightly coloured, pulled by females, no doubt, and freed to go there by the absence of dangerous predators. One of the nice things about science is that it is a public activity. Scientists publish their methods as well as their conclusions, which means that anybody else, anywhere in the world, can repeat their work. If they don't get the same results, we want to know the reason why. Usually they don't just repeat previous work, but extend it, carry it further. John Endler's brilliant research on guppies was just begging to be continued and extended. Among those who have taken it up is David Resnick of the University of California at Riverside. Nine years after Endler sampled his experimental stream with such spectacular results, Resnick and his colleagues revisited the place and sampled the descendants of Endler's experimental population yet again. The males were now very brightly coloured. The female-driven trend that Endler observed had continued with a vengeance. And that wasn't all. 
You remember the silver foxes and how artificial selection for one characteristic, tameness, pulled along in its wake a whole cluster of others, changes in breeding season, in ears, tail, coat colour, and other things. Well, a similar thing happened with the guppies under natural selection. Resnick and Endler had already noticed that when you compare guppies in predator-infested streams with guppies in streams with only weak predation, colour differences are only the tip of the iceberg. There is a whole cluster of other differences. Guppies from low predation streams reach sexual maturity later than those from high predation streams, and they're larger when they reach adulthood. They produce litters of young less frequently, and their litters are smaller, with larger offspring. When Resnick examined the descendants of endless guppies, his findings were almost too good to be true. The ones that had been freed to follow female-driven sexual selection rather than predator-driven selection for individual survival had not only become more brightly coloured, in all the other respects I've just listed, these fish had evolved the full cluster of other changes to match those normally found in wild populations free from predators. The guppies matured at a later age than in predator-infested streams. They were larger, and they produced fewer and larger offspring. The balance had shifted towards the norm for predator-free pools where sexual attractiveness takes priority. And it all happened staggeringly fast by evolutionary standards. Later in the book, we shall see that the evolutionary change witnessed by Endler and Resnick, driven purely by natural selection, strictly including sexual selection, raced ahead at a speed comparable to that achieved by artificial selection of domestic animals. It is a spectacular example of evolution before our very eyes.